Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, warshippers of all ages, welcome back to YouTube. My name is Sea Raptor, and it is time to continue our Learn to Play series with the IJN Destroyer Centric, uh, tor Destroyer Centric, Torpedo Centric branch of their Destroyer line by taking a look at Tier 7's Akatsuki. Now, it's been a bit of a break. I took some time off over the holidays, like most of us did, but we're in January now. It's time to get back at this. And one of the reasons that it's taken me a while to get this video made is that it was a real struggle to get a good game in Akatsuki. Now, that's going to sound early this early in the video. That's going to sound kind of like, you know, I'm damning the ship a little bit. And it has its flaws. You're going to struggle with this ship, but it has things going for it. The, tr the trick is maximizing them. That is 100% the challenge of this ship. And we're going to talk about why that is and what it really does well and what it's really going to struggle with. And yeah, we're going to talk about all that in the course of this video. But I'll summarize real quickly here at the beginning by saying, after this point, this is probably the most challenging ship in this branch to play. After this, in my opinion, the line gets easier. Not necessarily better, but easier. And I'll highlight why that is in a minute. So if you're going to pick one ship in this line that you want to you want a free XP pass, if you've got the free XP laying around, you want to get away from it, this would probably be the one because you're going to have Akatsuki. In my opinion, is a very feast or famine ship. You're going to have you're going to have some games that are like, yeah, I am rocking it, and then you're going to have other games is like, well, that sucked, and that's just that is unfortunately in my experience kind of the nature of the beast because of the tier you're in and the particulars of this ship. So let's. Take a, take a spin around, we'll talk about why I feel like that is, and we'll, we'll finish up by showing you some sample gameplay as always, all right? So, starting off as we do, survivability, you see there, this is a little over 15 and a half thousand hit points that is fully buffed. I am running survivability expert here on the captain, which gives me some more HP, about another 20, 2400 and change, something along those lines. Akatsuki's base health pool is just a shade over 13,000 hit points, and while that is not worst in tier, it is... Very, very, very close to worst in tier. So this is something, one of many things, that Akatsuki does badly. She does not have a lot of health. She cannot hang in fights very long when she's spotted. And that's going to be a particular challenge because, well, we're going to talk about her concealment problems in a minute. Um, the good news is, is that, well, no, never mind. There really is no good news in this. <laughs> there is no good news. This is bad. Um... Akatsuki is going to struggle. Um, you know, I when we get to captain's builds in a little bit, I've done something that I wouldn't probably ordinarily do on this ship, and I've taken RPF, and I've taken RPF on this ship specifically so I can try and avoid other destroyers because I'm going to have a hard time out spotting many of the destroyers in my matchmaking bracket, and I want to just not be spotted, and I certainly don't want to be spotted early in a game. So, yeah, learning to manage this health pool is easily one of the biggest challenges of the ship. Um, armor? Yeah. No, you don't have any armor. Like, you're a destroyer. <laughs> LOL. Keep going. Keep Next next category. That's not a thing. Um, maneuverability and concealment. We're going to talk about concealment first, because there's more to talk about here, and the news is bad. A max stealth build Akatsuki is 6.4 kilometers on the surface. This is not worst in tier, <laughs> but it is really, really, really bad. For a ship with this low of a health pool, to have this high of a detection makes it very challenging to play. If you're, if you've, if you've watched some of my other Learn to Play videos, we really harped on this when we talked about Tier 6 American Destroyer USS Farragut. Farragut has the worst in-tier health pool at Tier 6 and the worst in-tier detection at Tier 6 for destroyers. So that ship has the worst of both worlds. She has low HP and high detection. Akatsuki is not quite as bad, but very close to it. And that's why, and she's a tier higher. So that you're gonna like you're gonna run into all kinds of opponents that outspot you. You're gonna run into all kinds of radar. That's why I say this ship is sometimes feast or famine, right? Like you're gonna have games where you're just gonna get smashed or you're gonna go out very quickly, and it's like, well, that sucked. And then occasionally you're gonna get a tier eight game with not much radar in it, you're gonna get a tier seven game, and as long as you know what you're doing, you bounce you manage your health pool correctly, you can crush. And this detection is expressly why. This is the ship's single biggest handicap. You're going to fight this detection range forever. This is worst in tier for the line. Like, the Japanese destroyer line, if you remember down at Mutsuki, was like, what, five and a half? And it got a little worse at Fubuki, 6-0, but 6-0 is still manageable, right? Especially at tier six, where there's a lot of destroyers in that range. But now we're at tier seven. 
And at tier seven, you're going to start seeing a lot of eight and nine opponents, right? Who have sub six detection and you're like six and a half. So this is really, really, really rough. Now, the good news is from a speed and maneuverability standpoint, Akatsuki retains many of the characteristics of her predecessor. This ship, this class of ships is actually a, um, a uh, improvement. It's like an improved Fubuki class ship, basically. Um, and so she's a little faster. She handles about the same. Uh, your base speed there is 38 knots. You see there 39.9 with the flag. When you put a speed boost on, this ship will easily uh, touch a, uh, get a touch over 30, uh, 43 knots or so. That is excellent speed for this tier. 38 knots base is not quite best in tier because the, the, the Russians still exist and the French still exist, but you're way, way up there on the speed. I think, this, I think she's actually tied for fourth best in tier seven. Um, and there's a lot, whole lot of ships that you outclass in this department. So the speed is good. This is an asset. You're going to use this mostly. <laughs> this is going to sound terrible. You can use this a lot of time to run away, to, to, to avoid engagements that you don't want to be in because you're just going to get dead or get shot at for more of your health than you want to give up at a certain moment. So the speed is good, but unfortunately, it, you know, you've still got to fight that 6.4 detection the entire time you play this ship. And that is, uh, that is unfortunate. Now, what does this ship do well? Well, we're, let's get into the good stuff, okay? For starters, the main battery. Akatsuki moves from Fubuki. If you remember, we had two of these little uh, twin-barreled Japanese 127s. Now here up at Akatsuki, we have three of them. And this is a notable increase. <laughs> I mean, literally a one-third, well, I guess 50% increase in her firepower. These are excellent destroyer guns. Their main handicap, as always, as has been the case up to this point in the line, is the rate of fire. It's very bad. You see there, seven and a half seconds. But the shell damage, 2150, is stellar. Akatsuki, being able to put six, shell, six of these shells downrange on that HE, Akatsuki has the highest alpha strike for an HE salvo of any tier seven destroyer. That sounds ridiculous. You wouldn't expect that out of a Japanese destroyer, but that's how good these guns are. Where she falls off is the reload because she has the worst DPM out of those guns. So Akatsuki is a ship that when she's not in smoke, when you're in smoke and you can fire from concealment, hey, all the rules are off. You know, you do you. But when you're in an open water running gunfight, you want to only be try using your guns to willingly engage targets that you can kill in one to three salvos, in my opinion. If, so this is a ship that doesn't want to start a gunfight, but she's happy to finish one in the mid to a late game when the, an opposing destroyer has done dumb things. Maybe he ate a torpedo. Maybe he got shot at by your teammates. Whatever happened, that guy's on half or a third of his HP. Most of the most of the destroyers you're going to run into in your matchmaking, um, you know, once they get that low, you can kill them in again one to three salvos, depending on depending on the ship, depending on where you hit him, and how the engagement plays out. Here's the disadvantage. Whoever you're fighting probably outspots you. So he's going to see you coming. Um, and that is unfortunately something that uh, that you're going to kind of have to learn to manage. It's just, it's a quirk of the ship that I can't, I can't, I can't help you with, guys. You're going to have to figure that one out for yourself. But the guns are really good once you wrap your brain around when to use them. And I'm going to really emphasize this because the guns from here get better. Right. Once you get to Kagero and Yugumo, you still have the same number of bells, the same number of turrets, but the reload starts to get a little better. So now you start to find yourself able to put and your detection is significantly better starting next year. And so now you find yourself in a position to potentially dictate a gunfight later in a game or in a mid game against a low health destroyer. Akatsuki's gunfights you're in your in my experience are mostly going to be of the reactionary type. This is not a destroyer where you're going to be able to hunt somebody down with your guns and finish them off. But if they come to you or you blunder into them, hey, you know, you've got the tools. Make it happen. Don't be afraid to fire them. Starting with Kagero, next tier, the shoe's on the other foot. The guns are still this good. They still have this crazy alpha. But now you're marrying it to what is almost basically best in tier detection values. And that allows you to be a bit more of a destroyer hunter in the late game against low health targets. But we'll talk about that when we get to Kagero. So, guns. A best in tier alpha strike worst into your DPM. That's the big takeaway I want you to I want you to take away with these guns. Know when to fire them. Don't fire them very often and try not to fire them continuously unless you have some kind of cover to fire from behind or you're in smoke or whatever because otherwise you will eventually get shot and 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 go out of the game because again, worst into your health pool. Almost almost worst into your health pool. So, keep that in mind. All right, torpedoes. 
you have almost exactly the same torpedo armament you had on Fubuki. This is, of course, an improved Fubuki class ship. So you have three triple launchers, right, to, to these kind of two midships, and then the one that's just forward of stack number two. Uh, the firing angles on these are pretty solid. Um, I don't recall having too many issues with them. I think technically, like like historically, the, the, the port arc off of this third launcher here would have been ob obscured by all of this structure here, but I don't think Wargaming penalizes you for that. I've never had a problem with it. So you might see it in the model and be a little concerned, but don't worry about it. I think, I think the launcher basically ignores it for purposes of gameplay. Um, but yeah, these are... Again, more or less the same torpedo launchers you had on Fubuki. The torpedoes are slightly better. They're a hair faster by three knots. I'll put the stats up here. Here we go. So you've gone, uh, the torpedoes are now a 62 knot base speed with a, uh, an alpha that's just a touch over 17,000. So you're getting about a thousand more damage, a few more knots of speed out of these torpedoes. Um, you're also getting uh, the same reload, right? These are 60, uh, 76 seconds base. That is not, uh, I, is that best in tier? I think there's probably somebody whose torpedoes reload faster. Yeah, like Bliss and Schoonie and that. So there's guys that there's guys that reload their torpedoes faster, but those people, their torpedoes don't hit this hard and they don't have nearly this many tubes. Akatsuki has far and away the highest torpedo DPM in tier seven. The only other ship that comes close is hilariously it's the french it's vauclen right because vauclen has three triples as well they're configured a little differently like the french have one left one excuse me one port one starboard and one center line um but his torpedoes reload on 120 seconds they hit harder actually they don't hit harder um they do they hang on where's the spreadsheet here we go yeah they do hit harder um but they don't reload nearly as quick uh, sorry 90 second reload apologies on a higher on a higher alpha so you're your torpedo centric here really, really comes out, right? You have 10 kilometer torpedoes. They move fairly quick, a little quicker than Fubuki. They hit a little harder than Fubuki. You have more gun power than Fubuki. You have more raw offensive power packed into this hull than you had at tier six. The trade off for that is you're less stealthy. That's how Wargaming is kind of balancing the ship a little bit. And at this tier, tier seven, the matchmaking, the opponents you'll face, that will feel a little unfortunate. Um, but yeah, these are excellent torpedoes. I, I would hesitate to call them best in tier, but they are more than adequate tools for what you want and need to be doing with them over the course of a game. So don't, don't, don't let that discourage you. That will not be your problem. Your problem is going to be down here fighting this concealment. I can't, I can't emphasize that enough. Depth charges. Uh, like her predecessors, Akatsuki has excellent depth charges here. Just a touch under 5,000 damage each. Uh, eight bombs in a stick. Two sticks ready to go uh, once they reload. Once they load at the start of a match. So I think Fubuki had six uh, six bomb sticks. I don't remember precisely, but either way, you have plenty of uh, plenty of firepower here. Once you are near on top of whatever an opposing submarine, you will punish that guy. Now Akatsuki. Again, I'm going to keep harping this. The concealment on this ship does not lend itself well to destroyer hunting. You will occasionally find yourself in situations where an enemy, uh, sorry, destroyer hunting, submarine hunting, where an enemy submarine has, you know, moved, they're grossly out of position, they're way overextended, and you can hunt that guy, and you have all the tools you need, go to town, murder him. But your detection works against you. If you're up against a submarine who is clever, who is playing closer to his teammates, sometimes literally up underneath their hulls, you will, like all destroyers, struggle to go after him. And that extra that extra detection you have, that 6.4 detection, will make it more difficult to utilize them. So it's a great asset of the ship. You don't want to forget about it, but you probably don't want to be like throwing away your ship to look for a chance to go depth charge an opposing submarine unless you've really got that red, ha red haze, you know, bloodlust in your eyes because you got wronged by a sub in a previous game and this guy, this guy's going to pay the price. We've all been there, right? So... Um, yeah, keep in mind, those are excellent. Um, look for opportunities to use them. Don't trade your ship for an opposing submarine, please. A defenses, terrible. I mean, this is, again, you've heard this song before. You're going to continue to hear it. I'm only putting up one flak puff. My, my AA does go out to 5.8. These are dual purpose main battery guns, hilariously. This is the big change from Fubuki was that the Imperial Japanese Navy, um, turned these turrets, these main battery turrets, into dual-purpose guns. These guns could elevate significantly higher than the ones on Fubuki. I think these go up to about 25 or 30 degrees, maybe 15 degrees. They go, they go up very high. So these are dual-purpose guns. But for some reason, Wargaming has elected to continue to keep them 
Garbo, <laughs> terrible when it comes to flak. I'm only putting up one flak puff despite having six barrels available. My continuous damage on the outer ring is, again, terrible, 53 um, DPS. And then, of course, my inner ring on the back of the 25 millimeter racks uh, that are all over the place is still not amazing. So I have a long range bubble. I have some AA, but it's certainly nothing to get excited about. This is a ship. Remember about it, Fabuki, I talked about. You could probably leave your AA on all the time and you wouldn't notice. It wouldn't bother you because you've only got the short range AA bubble. Akatsuki, you absolutely want to start keeping your AA turned off unless you are confident or trying to pitch in or you know he's not coming for you or you're spotted anyway or whatever. So it's much more critical that you manually juggle your anti-aircraft fire in Akatsuki than in the preceding two ships of the line. This is, again, this is another skill you need to carry forward. Learn it here. Carry it forward to Kagero and Yugamo and Shimakaze. Uh, let's talk through let's talk through some builds here. Let's see. All right, so modules. I mean, um, this is pretty straightforward. Main armaments mod one here in slot one. There's not really any other good options in here. I mean, you might consider DCP, but I I wouldn't go this route. Um, in slot two, again, I'm running engine room protection. Um, I like I like pairing this with the last stand to try and keep my engine and my rudder working as much as possible. If you would rather run engine boost modification, hey, perfectly valid choice. If that's your if that's your bag, you go you you do you. I would not run damage control. This is not really a, of a huge benefit to a destroyer. Here in slot three, you have a couple of options, just like at Fubuki, that might be good. I feel very strongly that a ship with triple launchers needs to be running Torpedo 2's modification. Not only do you want that, that uh, reduction in, in risk that the, tube, the, the tubes themselves become incapacitated, the extra speed, that extra 5% speed, and the, ter the traverse speed of the, of the uh, torpedo uh, turrets themselves, the torpedo tubes themselves, all of that, everything, everything this upgrade provides is excellent. So I cannot recommend this enough. If you want to look into something else, I would potentially look into main battery modification. I don't like this. Again, I keep coming back to you should not be firing these guns except in very corner cases or extreme situations. So I don't think you're going to get nearly as much value out of main battery mod 2 as you will out of torpedo tubes 1. Aiming systems mod. I'd say that I'd say the case for this one is even a little stronger than main battery mod because the alpha strike out of your guns is the goal, right? You want to be able to put as many shells on target with as few salvos as possible for maximum damage when you do decide to open up with your guns. So in my mind, if you wanted to go this route, this is not a bad choice. I still think torpedo is better, but you could make you could make a case here. Don't invest in your AA, and I don't think the smoke generator here is worth it. Personal opinion. Slot four, again, propulsion mod is my recommendation. Um, I think the, the maneuverability of the ship, you have a 3.2 rudder shift base. This rudder shift mod is not going to make a significant improvement. You're going to lose like maybe half a second. You'll never notice the difference. Um, depth charges modification would give you two more stick, two more sticks. Again, if this is a, this is your, if you really want to lean into this, hey, you go, you know, you do you. I don't recommend it. I think I think propulsion mod is a better pickup, but I could see it. There's a valid case to be made here. This just gives you more charges of your eight bombs. Uh, when you want them. Um, damage control, again, I wouldn't take this. I don't think it's, I don't think there's a lot of value in this for a destroyer. Um, signals, again, I'm running Juliet Charlie. I'll always recommend this flag if you have it. Just like Fubuki, I'm running Sierra Mike, November Foxtrot, and all the flags that boost my fire and flood chances. Pretty much all the rest of these flags are not really all that valuable to you. Your A is not worth investing in November Echo Set of 7 in. And again, unless you're, if you're playing in a div and you're really, you're going to lean into somebody using your smoke for something, I mean, you know, then the smoke mod maybe over here, um, uh, you know, something like that or an X-Ray Papa Uni 1. Okay, I could see it, right? But like just you run, derping around the ship trying to grind it out, playing solo games. Nah, don't, don't invest in any of these. Again, just like um, Fabuki, you are stuck with your consumables. You have no choices. You're getting damage control, smoke, and uh, engine boost, and that's it. None of these can be changed out. Captain skills. Very similar build to Fubuki here. Well, similar, but not identical. Um, if you remember at Fubuki, I didn't take radio location, and I have it here, and I'll tell you why in just a minute. For your first 10 points, I would stick with the usual. I would always recommend preventive maintenance, last stand, survivability expert, and concealment as your first 10 points in almost any destroyer captain, like... Even a, even a destroyer that you don't want to, like if you just go that for your first 10 points, you've already got a solid, you're well on your way to having a solid destroyer captain. Um, I do like Grease the Gears here in in uh, for one point. Uh, if you don't if you don't care about the guns at all and you want more torpedoes, hey, take Liquidator. I think there's totally totally valid option. You could also take Consumable Specialist. I think any one of these three are really good skills for a single point. You will get use out of that. Um, 
for tier two. Again, I don't have Swift Fish, but if I had the points in this build, I would absolutely do it. That extra 5% speed gives you another, I think another three knots of speed, three or four knots on your torpedoes. That puts them almost to nearly 70 knots. They'd be like 68 or 69 knot torpedoes. Again, you're just, all you're doing with this is you're reducing the reaction time of your opponents once they detect your fish. They're going to see them coming in, and the faster they move, the less time they have to do anything about it. Um, consumables enhancements, I wouldn't invest in. The extra heavy, uh, I don't think you need the depth charge damage, and you certainly don't really want to invest in the AP. You're almost, there are extreme corner cases where you will fire Akatsuki's AP, but they're very rare, certainly not enough to be investing in this skill. Priority target, an excellent skill for two points. If you're concerned about getting spotted, and in this ship, that's a very valid concern, and figuring out who's looking at you, priority target is an excellent pickup. I've just gotten to where I don't take this on every destroyer. I just assume that if I'm spotted as a destroyer, everyone's going to be shooting at me. So priority target is a great a great tool to have in your toolbox if you want it. I will not I will not discount the skill. I've just gotten to where I don't take it in every single build. Um, up at tier three, fill the tubes. I feel like this is a mandatory skill for a Japanese torpedo destroyer. I, I, I wouldn't. I don't know why you would build one without it. This ship has, as I said earlier, the best torpedo DPM in the tier. Maximize that and run with it. Adrenaline rush for similar reasons and almost on almost. On, on this ship, almost more than any in the line, you will get really good value out of this skill because you will get spotted and shot more than any other ship in the in the Japanese uh, torpedo branch, like period. So adrenaline rush, I feel like, is almost mandatory. Now we talked about radio location. This is kind of the this is kind of the weird place that I would I would take this skill and why I took it on this build. We talked about it down at Mutsuki. We're going to talk about it again with Kagero, Yugimo, and Shimakaze. On those four ships in this branch, you have almost best in tier detection, if not straight up best in tier. So this skill then allows you to learn to avoid, um, not only to avoid potential uh, destroyer clashes, even though you outspot somebody, you at least have an idea of where to be looking for him. Um, but it also allows you to potentially like blind fire torpedoes at a destroyer that you suspect is there, but you don't know. So you you know you use the R, you use the radio location um, marker to like vomit your torpedoes out in that direction, and sometimes that will generate hits. On Akatsuki, though, we're at the other end of the scale. We have worst in tier detection. So what does radio location get us here? Radio location here almost guarantees you the ability, I won't say guarantees, it makes it just a little easier to avoid getting spotted when you don't want to be. In the sense of um, when you're at work, when you're operating around a cap circle, um, you can almost usually guarantee that there's another destroyer around, again, depending on the stage of the game. But let's just assume, let's say it's early in a game. There's probably another destroyer on the other side of that cap circle, depending on the matchmaking. But chances are good with this ship, he probably outspots you. Having an idea of where he is, learning to hang back and learning where to fire those torpedoes to maybe get rid of him or drive him off, push him back, can be helpful. I've had some success with this skill on this ship. It has not been universal. Let's put it this way. I'm trying this skill. I'm still deciding if I like it. If eventually, if you don't think this is a valuable skill for the ship, I'd say go back here and go with a more traditional build. Pick up Swift Fish, um, Liquidator, and Consumable Specialist. Like, take those four points and do something else useful with them down here. And you will not be sorry. You will absolutely get value out of those skills, 100%. Um, radio Location is one that on Akatsuki, I feel like maybe is a corner case. So try it. If you don't like it, you know, maybe eventually respect the captain. Try something else. All right, let's go have a little bit, a look at sample gameplay, and then we'll come back here and uh, and say goodbye. All right, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, to our little sample game here in Tier Seven Japanese Destroyer Akatsuki. Good luck, everyone. Now I'm spawning here on the south side of Haven. I'm going to pause this real briefly because I want to talk through my opening deployment ideas. Right, I spawned dead center of the map, and as you can see, I've already chosen to head over to the western flank, over towards the 3-4 line, in a standard battle, right? Why did I make that choice? Well, for starters, I took a look at the team, and on that flank, I see a Nicholas, and I see the Undine. So, for me, I looked at that and went, oh, on my right flank, over there on those, the 9 line, you see the other destroyer on the team is a Mutsuki. And I'm like, okay, I feel like I have better, a better chance, better option, uh, I'm trying to think about this, better... I think, I think things are going to go better over here if I pair up with the submarine to maximize my torpedo damage and possible flood values. And having the Nicholas around gives me more gun friendly gunpower nearby than I would have on my own. In the sense of, 
like we talked about earlier in the video, Akatsuki has uh, plenty of barrels, but the reload isn't really there. So she's good at finishing up gunfights. But her detection makes that pretty challenging at times. Matchmaking has kindly gifted me a top-tier match, so at least I've got that going for me. But having that little bit of extra reload around, that little bit, you know, the Nicholas is a nice friend to have nearby. So I've gone ahead and popped the speed boost and gone, and I'm racing for the 3-4 line. Ordinarily, I wouldn't pop a speed boost at the start of a game, but in this instance, because I spawned in the mid, and because hanging out in the middle of the map is not going to do me any good, well, that's not entirely accurate, but it's not where I want to be, right? You generally don't want to put your destroyer in a spot, in an area of the map where if it gets spotted, it can get shot at by lots and lots of people. So some, like in a map like Haven here, picking a flank, playing that flank is not necessarily a bad idea. Now, you can see the opposing T-22 and U-69 already coming coming this way, closing in this gap in front of me. I'm going to go ahead and speculatively launch some torpedoes out here. There's at least one battleship right behind them. That's the Dunkirk. So they know I'm here now. The, the T-22 catches a brief glimpse of me. And it was my thought process here was, look, somebody's in that gap, and the T-22 is likely to have his hydro up, and I understand that, but, but sometimes destroyer players screw up, right? You know, don't, don't make... Don't talk yourself out of making smart plays on the assumption that your opponent is going to do the smart thing, right, and to counter it. Because sometimes your opponents are bad. So force them to make good plays. And in this instance, it does work out. The T-22, uh, either by luck or by hydro, dodges all of these torpedoes. The Dunkirk uh, moves out of the way of them. And I guess the U-69 either navigated through or just dove, simply dove under them, one or the other. Now, the U-69 is starting to get kind of close here. Now, I'm going to I'm going to pause real briefly to talk through the next couple of minutes. My thinking is this, the Dunkirk now starting to turn looking like he's going to keep coming down the three line. So what you're going to see me do is turn back to starboard. I'm trying to keep the Dunkirk in I'm trying to keep this island in between the Dunkirk and I. The Dunkirk is less than 6.2 kilometers away. I have 6.4 kilometer detection. So if not for this island, the Dunkirk would already be shooting me. Okay, so I'm trying to keep this physical barrier in place, but with the sub continuing to move this way and we can see him, we know he's there, I'm like, you know what, maybe I should get over here and bomb him, or bomb him, depth charge him, right, like why not, my team's making some end roads there, and the T-22 has also backed off, so right now I do not want to keep heading west, I want to stay by this island as best I can and maybe move up the four line just a hair. Now, the trick is the T-22 has already got me well inside his hydro range. His hydro range, I think, is about four kilometers, and I'm already inside of, like, two and... I'm, like, right at two and a half or so. Yeah. And sure enough, as soon as he pushes the button, I am spotted on hydro. The sub seems to be right in front of me based on that little ping. So we're gonna, we're gonna make a little bit of a loop here, dump some depth charges in the hopes that maybe we'll catch him with some splash damage, and as it turns out, not so much. The T-22, for some reason, comes all the way around the corner... And is just out here getting shot by everybody. I don't even have my guns looking that way yet. I am trying to get them on target here. While the Dunkirk, is his secondaries are busy kicking me in the teeth. I'm going to get a good salvo in here. We are going to pick up the kill on the T-22. And then I am immediately going to take a salvo from the Dunkirk and say, No, I want no part of this. Let me get back behind some cover here and just chill. Now, what I had sort of been hoping was that the Dunkirk was going to back off and let me go hunt the submarine, but he didn't, he's not, and so here we are. Maya, unfortunately, is also out here hunting me, right? The, the Dunkirk's plane caught a brief glimpse, and now I'm stuck with a double fire for a minute. So, screw it, it's time to go ahead and smoke. The Maya's doing great work with his guns, though. The Japanese heavies are so irritatingly good at that, and this submarine is still right here. And I would murder him, except for the fact that he's got a buddy nearby. The best submarine players are the one, the irritating ones that keep their friends close, right? Because it means that getting on top of them with depth charges is very challenging. The Dunkirk, continuing to move in this direction. I'm going to leave these torpedoes for him in the hopes that he'll blunder into... Probably, he only really needs to blunder into just one of them at this stage. And I think I'm going to get him... Looks like it. Yeah, I think he's speed boosted or something, but I'm going to catch him in the bow with one. That's all I need for kill number two. Not a lot of damage, but I'm picking up the kills. The U-69 you see there, pulling out, backing off, realizing that this is not someplace he wants to hang out. And I've still got a little bit more smoke here. The Shiratsuya there up off the port bow. We catch a brief glimpse of him, but I'm going to try and help the Mackenzie here with this Maya. 
Now, Maya's got a heal, so this is perhaps not the smartest thing. But if I any damage I can do to this guy, maybe I can get a fire on him. Maybe I can get him to, to you know, maybe get things to stick. I don't know, but we'll see what goes. The Shiritsuyu takes out the friendly McKenzie with two torps. I do get a fire on the Maya. But now, my, my torpedoes reload, my, my attention turns to the California, who is, again, right here in front of me, less than six kilometers away from me, and I still cannot go hunt this submarine, who's right there. Like, oh my god, it just, oh, it's so irritating for him to be right there, and I can't just go murder him without losing my ship. Now I'm going to come out, I'm going to brief, they're going to catch a brief glimpse of me as I start to move out of this position with my smoke expiring. And I think it looks like I've got a good salvo on the California. He's going to eat four of those. And then I think, I think he's going to flood out. Yeah, he's going to flood out here. Actually, he's trying to heal through the flood now. He repaired the flood. Or no, he's trying to heal through the flood. So again, that's a, that's a good use of my guns to make sure we get rid of that guy as the Undine actually torpedoes the U-69 to get him off the board. Now, what I haven't realized until just this exact moment is that the war spite on my port side is inside my gun bloom ring. That's how I, how I was getting spotted right there. I'm so focused on the Maya and the Shiratsu in front of me, I don't even realize the war spite is there. There were so many enemy ships here. It was such a target-rich environment. I am just struggling to, to, stay, to stay abreast of everything to shoot at here. Maya looks like he's going to come around from outside that island. It means I've got to get a, back off a little bit and make sure to put some space between he and I. Because, again, 6.4 detection. I'm going to vomit some torpedoes out there in the hopes that maybe he'll continue moving towards our cap circle. But he is going to decline. And uh, he's going to back off. Go loop around back off. Those torpedoes aren't going to go anywhere. Team's doing okay. We're not even eight minutes into this game, and it's been a bloodbath already. Nine dead ships. Six for them, three for us. I've got three kills. I feel pretty good about that. And it's just now, just then, when I look over and realize, oh, crap, there's a war spite here. So now I'm trying to get into the smoke to get my guns on him to try and help these guys finish him off, right? The Undine's got torps going out. The Nicholas has got his guns going. Now I'm going to add my guns in. It's, you know, this guy is very low and all alone back here. We need to get rid of him. Torpedo markers coming in from a stern. I'm kind of playing a bit of a dangerous game here, but then I have a quick peek and realize, no, nah, I'm okay. Shiritsu's sort of wasted those. I do get a fire on the Renown, or excuse me, the War Spite, and do manage to land the killing blow there as his blind fire catches yet another shell. Kill number four. We've really been doing a lot of kill cleanup, honestly. I haven't really been, other than the California, which was a solid, oh yeah, I chunked that guy. Everything else is, oh, here, let me steal the last thousand health from you with my guns. All right, the enemy team now down to their last four ships. This has been a bit of a lightning round, right? In nine minutes, they've lost, they've lost seven of their, I mean, eight of their 12 ships. The Shiritsuyu, the Maya, up here off my starboard bow. The Undine and the Nicholas continuing to play with those guys. I don't want them to know where I am, so I'm going to push straight up the three line. There's a couple of things in their backfield that interest me, not the least of which is the opposing aircraft carrier. I am going to be able to take that shot for free over the island, so when I, look, when I find shots like that, I'm absolutely going to take them. When I can, someone's spotting you know, an opposing ship and I can use an island and get some shells over, yeah, I'll do it all the time. Every, all, all day, every day, baby. I could maybe have taken a shot right there at the Maya, but I didn't want to risk it. Sometimes the gun bloom mechanics are real weird in terms of how they, you know, the bloom, the bloom will last a second or two while the game checks to see if anybody's in your detection. And if you move into detection radius when that occurs, sometimes that that'll you'll get spotted. But I think I'm going to take. Do I take? Uh, I should have taken one more salvo right there, but it looks like I declined. I was basically trying to get my speed boost up. Now, I'm not sure what this Mai is going to do, so I'm going to dump these torpedoes out here on the assumption that he is going to get around that island off my starboard bow and turn back to the west. He isn't. Those torpedoes are all going to miss. But at the time, I was like, no, nope, I don't know this. I have to give this a shot. Undi and the Shiritsuyu now spotting each other on the surface. I think actually, actually, no, sorry, the Ark Royal making those spots. 
And again, ordinarily, if I had more health, I'd be potentially throwing my guns in on this, but I didn't want to risk it because I just didn't want to risk it, right? I've only got 3,000 health left. I can't afford to throw away health for silly reasons. Plus, there's a Nicholas and a Chumpan right on top of that guy. They ought to be able to murder this Shiritsuyu. Like, they shouldn't need my help to clean him up. The Maya has bailed, leaving him all by himself. And so, yeah, they don't need me for that. The Maya does punch out the Nicholas, however. So, now that I'm basically leaving the Shiritsu drama behind, my focus is twofold. One, I'm out here trying to find the opposing carrier. And two, I'm looking for torpedo angles on this Maya and the Perth that is very clearly back in their cap circle. You can see the shells coming out of that angry smoke cloud on the far side of their cap. So I'm making a little over 40 knots, chugging up the two line here. There's the opposing Serov. I'm going to take a peek on him in a minute. Not sure what this Maya is doing. He's cutting back to the east. Okay. All right. So then, the next, the next, um, the next focus I have to figure out is where's my next torpedo salvo going? The Serov is running away from me, which means the odds of me landing torpedoes on him are very, very small, unless for some reason he turns back to the west. So. I'm going to fire my torpedoes in the direction of the Perth smoke. Now, by the time they get there, the Perth may or may not be there. But the Maya looks like he's kind of looping through that space. So it's possible I'll land something, even though those are perhaps a bit of luck chuck. Serov is now inside of uh, right around a little over eight kilometers. I don't want to push too much closer to this guy, or I run the risk of one of his departing overflights just accidentally stumbling over me. His torpedoes and rockets are not really a threat to me um, necessarily because of their speed and, and my AA being off. However, the skip bombs could definitely be a problem if, uh, if I screw this up. Lucky for me, I do manage to clip the Maya with a torpedo and with one kill shy of a Kraken, I cannot pass up this opportunity. I'm going to put my guns over and look for an opportunity to shoot this guy. His guns are looking the other way, right? He may know I'm here, he may not, but either way, all I need is a few shells to secure this kill, and bam, there it is. Kraken unleashed. Now, doing that, I have signed my death warrant, and I know it. At the, I knew it at the time, and I'm, I'm telling you now, the Seraph will kill me. It's only a matter of time, right? I'm gonna since he knows I'm here and he's trying to maneuver. I'm gonna go ahead and throw some torpedoes out while I'm still alive, right? These are sort of just speculatively. He's obviously going to maneuver and joggle his throttle and everything. I have no idea where he where he's going to go. I'm just... Those are basically spray and pray. What I could have done here, maybe perhaps even should have done, was use the smoke to, to live a little longer than I ultimately do. He's going to pick me up here. He is going to be able to get a, uh, a bomb drop off. I sort of screwed this up a bit. I should have been... Should have been keeping my bow pointed at these guys. And instead, he manages to just barely clip me with one bomb out of that drop, then immediately cycle another another attack. And because my A was already ticking, he's going to get all the, all the duration that he wants out of this one, and it's this bomb drop right here that's going to finally end my game. I wait too late to, I wait too late to smoke right there, and, uh, well, that's my own fault. So I kind of misplayed the engagement there against the Serov. I probably could have done that a little better. Um, long story short, we're going to win this game. It's going to take another probably several minutes. I'm not going to show you all of that. Um, you can look where my team is, you know, basically down along the G line, other than the Colorado, and the last surviving enemy ship is in B1. So it's going to take a while for things to, um, things to play out. Yeah, it's, um, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm asking the Ark Royal, like, you should probably try dropping some fighters, that way the battleships can get some shells on him while he's spotted, and apparently that particular flight group that he just had out was out of fighters, um, and also Trick, I think, you'll see him do it in a minute, he actually drops them too close, he waits too late to drop them so that when he does, they actually wander into the AA bubble of the Serov, whereas most carriers like this, if you're going for spotting, you want to drop, like, right there. It's, you know, if he dropped the fighters right as soon as he got visual spotting on the Serov and not where he did, they probably would have lived a little longer and he would have gotten some spotting damage out of it. Um, so just a little bit of lesson learned like there. If you're if you're trying to use a carrier to, to spot uh, a carrier fighters to spot an opposing ship, um, 
don't wait until you're on top of their a bubble to drop the fighters if you can if your incoming bomber strike can spot them as soon as you spot the ship you're looking for drop the fighters or maybe wait a couple of seconds and then drop the fighters right because that way um they're right at the edge of his um uh, aerial detection bubble and well outside of his aa range and so they'll you'll, you should be able to get some good spotting damage out of that he is eventually going to uh, murder the colorado here uh, he's going to burn the Colorado out. Team's going to clean him up. And there is our end result. So a Kraken in Akatsuki, which is surprising, but good matchmaking makes these kinds of games possible. When you play an Akatsuki in your tier eight, tier nine games, you probably want to temper your expectations a little bit. You're going to struggle some. Uh, well, let's say struggle. It's going to be more challenging. Let's put it that way. It's going to be more challenging. Um, good XP result, though. 1,500 base XP on five kills and only not even quite 90,000 damage. The Undine apparently had a great game. Probably a lot of spotting damage, really contributing to his XP. Uh, subs get big, big XP for doing all that spotting. The opposing Maya, of course, having the best game on the opposing team, and he did play really, really well. But yeah, uh, six big torpedo hits. I kind of spread those out. I had one kind of fluke hit on the Maya, one of the Dunkirk, and then, of course, the big salvo on the California. Other than that, some chip damage with the guns, right? About 15,000, 16,000 there. Again, most of that on the Maya from Smoke. Um, and then the little finishing salvos I had on the War Spite and the Maya. Oh, and the T-22. Only two shells on him. I forgot about that guy. Yeah. So anyways, um, just a sample game in Akatsuki. Um didn't have to really work against many of her uh, bigger handicaps in this game, and that definitely shows. Um, you're going to struggle. I mean, like we talked about in the, you know, in, back in you know, looking over the ship, when you get up tiered, the detection is a real problem. In this particular game, most of the opposing destroyers that I was up against had similar detection values. Well, that's you well, know, that's not true. The T22 and the shirts you both outspotted me, but because of the island cover I was working around, I didn't have to play around it quite as much. This was one of those odd games because of where I spawned and the map configuration that I spent more time around islands than I typically enjoy doing in a Japanese destroyer, right? In the Fubuki video, I talked about playing in the open water. There's not a lot of open water on Haven unless you go way to the map edges, right? And I didn't really get the opportunity to do that until very late in the game. All right, ladies and gentlemen, there she is, Tier 7 Japanese destroyer Akatsuki. This is unquestionably the most difficult ship to play in this particular Japanese destroyer branch. So give yourself a little bit of grace. You will get frustrated. You will have bad games. It cannot be avoided, especially if you're learning these ships for the first time. Just smile and hit the battle on button. That's all I can say, okay? Um, the good news is, is that starting next tier it does get better. And if, like I said earlier in the video, if you're looking for a candidate to free XP in this line, this is what I would recommend. Play. You're going to want to play Kagero and Yugumo. They're excellent ships. They're fun. Akatsuki sometimes is really, really frustrating. So just don't be ashamed if you just decide, you know what? I, this is not for me. I'm moving on. But if you do decide to play her, hopefully this video helped you out a little bit. In the meantime, guys, appreciate your time. Wash your hands. Be safe. I'll catch you later.